Ash Ketchum from Pallet Town has finally achieved his dream of being the very best like no one ever was, aside from every 10 year old who's ever had a Game Boy. To commemorate the end of Ash's journey, I, Nuzlocke Joe, have decided to take Ash back to Kanto to see if he could have become the champion all those years ago. To make my run as Ash-like as possible, I'm playing through Pokemon Yellow with almost hardcore Nuzlocke rules. But if a Pokemon dies, I will simply restart that battle. I'm making this change because I'm also forcing myself to use the exact same team that Ash did for every gym battle. And considering that Ash has a habit of not evolving his Pokemon, this gets difficult fairly quickly. So let's walk through Kanto in Ash's surely worn out shoes. Unlike the anime, I'm late to get my Pokemon because I'm too busy playing Super Nintendo. Chrono Trigger is way too good to put down. I make it three whole steps out of Pallet Town before Old Man Oak stops me, and we encounter the only Pikachu to be ever seen in this route. Oak then says I can have the only Pokemon left. I choose you, Eve, or not. Man, this Gary kid is a jerk, stealing my Pokemon, and Grandpa Oak does nothing about it. Great parenting going on here. This leaves me with Pikachu, even though Eevee is certainly better. Yeah, that's right, I said it. What, you don't believe me? If Pikachu is so good, how come he loses to an Eevee? Good thing winning this fight isn't mandatory. The fainted Pikachu busts out of his Pokeball just to give me the cold shoulder. I'm sure he'll like me after we take on some Spearows. I have a Pokemon emergency in Viridian City that is quickly resolved when the Poke Center worker, who is actually Nurse Joy and a Chansey, heal my Pikachu. I forgot about that little change in yellow. It's pretty cool. Back in Pallet Town, Gary tells his sister not to give me a town map. But as we all know, Ash is a major flirt. Why else does he have so many girl companions? So, after debasing myself just a little bit, I now have a pointless item taking up precious space in my backpack. Uh, take that, Gary? In Viridian Forest, Ash catches a Pokemon without damaging it because he doesn't know how to Pokemon. In the same episode, I run through the grass like a maniac looking for a bird. You see, in yellow, there is a 1% chance to find an illegal Pidgeotto here. And since that is what Ash did, I need to do the same thing. And in the scientific world, a 1% chance of something happening means that 99% of the time, it won't. So, after a lot of running around, I eventually find and catch myself a level 9 Pidgeotto. But I can't leave the forest yet until I am challenged by a samurai and get a fully evolved Butterfree. And I hope you enjoyed that tiny taste of evolution because it's the last one we're going to have for quite a long while. In preparation for the showdown in Pewter, I have to put my newly evolved Butterfree, who just so happens to be my best brought counter, into the box because Ash only used a bird and a rodent for this fight. Again, he doesn't know how to Pokemon. My plan here is both simple and crappy. I start by sand attacking this Geode six freaking times, which is possible because Tackle is the only move this Geode knows. I then pivot to Pikachu, who is immediately hit, well that was a waste, and proceeds to Tail Whip a bunch of times. After a few whips, I thought maybe a quick attack would be strong enough but it clearly is not. After whipping his tail six times, the Geodude finally misses consistently, allowing Pikachu to take him out with several quick attacks. Next is the Onyx, who, for whatever reason, chooses to just use Bide, allowing Pika to get six more tail whips. I then pivot back to Pidgeotto for, you guessed it, more sand attacks, as he again keeps using Bide. After his defenses are down and he's completely blind, I can start attacking, but I do need to waste the turns he's using Bide so I don't get hit back even harder. I do that with a combination of Sand Attack and Tail Whip, even though they're not useful anymore, and by swapping back and forth between my Pokemon. Eventually, without the help of any sprinklers, I might add, I emerge victorious in what was certainly Brock's most infuriating battle ever. At this point in the show, Brock joins my team, but that doesn't happen here. Instead, if you want to join me on my Pokemon journey, you can by subscribing to Nuzlocke Joe for more Pokemon challenge videos just like this one. I get through Mount Moon without any Clefairies or Moonstones, though I am prepared for trouble. I do think it's pretty cool that you get to fight Jesse, James, and Meowth multiple times in this game. 
The water flower of Cerulean City, aka Misty, looks absolutely nothing like Misty. That sprite looks a lot better. Because Ash is Ash, he doesn't use his Pikachu in this fight. Instead, I need to use Butterfree and Pidgeotto. I leave with Butterfree and put Staryu to sleep. In this generation, waking up takes a whole turn on its own, so Butterfree should be safe. A few confusions, and the Staryu falls. The Starmie also falls asleep, but Butterfree's tackle does basically nothing because Misty used an X-Defend. So, I pivot to Pidgeotto to, again, use Sand Attack a bunch of times, but just as he's about to throw down with Gust, the Starmie wakes up and almost immediately gets a critical hit Bubble Beam knocking out my bird. All right, that is the first loss. Again, this is not a Nuzlocke, so I don't lose my Pokemon. It simply means I have to restart the battle. On attempt number three, both of my Pokemon are already at death's door, but the Starmie is poisoned. So I get lucky with sand attacks and Butterfree comes out to finish the job with confusion and poison damage. That would have been a lot easier with an electric Pokemon. Come on, Ash. And it's immediately time for a Gary fight. But since this isn't in the anime, I can use all of my Pokemon. And Pikachu has plenty of experience with taking out Spearow. The Sandshrew doesn't actually know any ground moves, so I'm confident that Pikachu can take him. At this point, I bring out Pidgeotto to take out the Shrew, and then the Rat with a couple of Gusts. Last is Eevee, a much more iconic Pokemon than some electric rat, and I send out Butterfree to use Confusion. Things are going okay, except Gary is spamming Sand Attack. Now, you might say that it's Karma, because I did the exact same thing against both Brock and Misty. The difference is, I'm the protagonist, so I get a free pass on these cheap strategies. Anyway, because of all that sand, I need to bring Pidgeotto back out to finish off the Eevee. To find the hidden village Bulbasaur, I need a happier Pikachu. So, naturally, I shove a ton of potions down his throat until he likes me. Nothing weird or creepy about that at all. Because I clearly love my Pokemon so much, this lady gives me a Bulbasaur. Yay, another Pokemon who will never evolve. The next episode, there is a random guy who wants to get rid of his Charmander, so I take the stray Pokemon in and cover his tail in a rainstorm. How could anyone want to get rid of this little guy? He will be one of the few Pokemon who actually does evolve, but it takes a heck of a lot longer than you might think. Speaking of evolving, we find this Bill character who has evolved beyond humanity to become a Clefairy? The only mystery at this lighthouse is out of all the 151 Pokemon that exist, and that's all that will ever exist, by the way, why fuse with a Clefairy? I mean, he could easily fuse with Arcanine to become an awesome talking dog, or not. Anyway, there's no 100 foot Dragonite here, unfortunately. I do, however, get a Super Rod a bit early because Ash catches a Krabby, so I felt like a little bit of cheating was okay. Too bad he's gonna be in the box for basically the entire run. I have several easy battles aboard the SSN, but they're not worth showing. Not even the fight against Gary. I briefly consider trading away my Butterfree, but that would be a huge mistake. Not even Ash is that stupid. The gym battle in the Electric Shock Showdown is one of the most iconic in the anime, at least in my opinion. Basically, I can only fight Surge's Raichu with my own much weaker Pikachu. And the anime lied to me, because Pikachu is in fact not faster than Raichu. If you can't trust the Poke anime with Poke facts, who can you trust? I decide to start by paralyzing the Raichu, using a few double teams, and just hoping for the best. There is no way my Pika can win in a straight fight. And my plan is going pretty well, actually. The Raichu is down to a sliver of HP, but then he outspeeds me because of an X speed and manages to hit with a Mega Punch for the knockout. But that's okay. It was all according to plan because Ash does actually lose the first try. So it's all good. The next two attempts end in failure, but that was also according to plan. Anyway, on the fourth try, I get lucky with Raichu missing and Pikachu hitting, so I end up victorious. That fight was way tougher than what was portrayed in the anime. I needed more than just a quick attack. After that match, here I come to break up the Squirtle Squad. Yay! Another Pokemon who won't evolve. Woohoo! 
Next, you probably think I can lure a primate with some bananas, but that is a hurtful stereotype. Instead, his favorite food is onigiri, or as Brock likes to call it, jelly filled donut. Because as we all know, they're the exact same thing. We don't want our children to be too cultured now, do we, four kids? Technically speaking, Ash catches a primate, not a manki, and he does it a bit later, but I don't have that option, so I just go with a regular old monkey, and I'll evolve him in the future. I get through Rock Tunnel, that is conspicuously absent in the anime, and I hope you're ready to get hit right in the feels, because now it's time to say bye-bye to Butterfree. I still remember how sad this episode made me way back in 1998, and now I'm sad because I'm old. Goodbye, my friend. You deserve to fly off into the sunset with your pink girlfriend and make lots of little Caterpie babies. Man, that still hurts a little bit. With that dead weight off my shoulders, we head to Celadon to fight Erika. Now, in the anime, Sabrina does happen earlier, but the level cap for Erika is lower, so let's just smell the Pokemon sensation first. Well, that was a weird segue. Since I can use Charmander in this fight, things should be pretty easy, right? Wrong. The only fire move he has access to is Ember, so it takes quite a while to even defeat her easiest Pokemon, Tangela. The Weeping Bell does a decent chunk with Acid, so I need to pivot to Pikachu, who is immediately crit and basically dies. Not gonna win this one. After several more losses at the hands of this bell, I make a few changes and have a solid start against Tangela. The biggest issue here is Bind, because in Generation 1, Bind prevents you from attacking at all, just like Wrap in Firespin. It does not, however, prevent you from switching. So, I simply swap my Pokemon around to avoid or break out of Bind and take out the Tangela fairly easily. The Weeping Bell is immediately burned, which was pretty awesome. Even though Charmander clearly has this in the bag, I swap to Pikachu as he and the Bell miss a few moves until Pikachu's slam connects, bringing out the Gloom. Now I need a Pikachu out here so I could paralyze the Gloom and take a ton from Petal Dance. Charmander comes out to soak up a hit until I finally pivot to Bulbasaur who has takedown. It's still pretty weak to be honest, but with a bit of fully paralyzed luck, Bulbasaur does manage to be victorious. Okay, that was the hardest gym battle so far. In the anime, Ash got really lucky because Erika just straight up gave him this badge. It's been a while since I've had a run-in with Team Rocket, so let's check up on them, shall we? And that was exciting. Good job, Pikachu. I have a Giovanni fight, but there are no restrictions on who I can use, so my little Squirtle water guns the Onyx, as well as the Rhyhorn, bringing out the remarkably buff-looking Persian. Is it just me, or did Persian not skip leg day? This cat actually requires a few swaps, because I get pretty close to death a few times, but between Squirtle, Pikachu, and Pidgeotto, they eventually manage to take him out. I backtrack to the Tower of Terror, and not the one in California, to encounter Gary, who's looking for a Marowak. But this fight isn't much of one. You see, my Pikachu got an electric boost from some random guy's watermill, so he eliminates all of Gary's Pokemon by his lonesome. He barely even gets hurt too. Team Rocket, again, tries to steal Pikachu, and now they have Arbok and Weezing. Still, we defeat them easily enough, but I can't leave yet. Not until I get myself a Haunter. Now in reality, Ash never caught a Haunter, but in order to have a Haunter versus Kadabra battle, I actually need one. Before that though, I have even more Team Rockety stuff to do, which involves Gary for some reason. This fight is a bit more difficult than the last one though. My level 40 Squirtle, takes out the Sand Slash with two Bubble Beams after taking a crit. This baits out Magneton, so I swap to Bulbasaur to use Leech Seed, and then Mega Drain. It's a good thing he's not Steel-type, because in Kanto, we're stuck in the Stone Age. Bulba is healing about 12 HP every turn, but Sonic Boom does 20. So the Magneton could take him out, if he didn't use Tackle a few times instead. Squirtle is still too hurt to face the Many Tails, so Charmander comes out, and gets pretty lucky, winning in a few slashes and barely getting hurt himself. I leave him in against the Kadabra, barely miss out on the kill with a slash, and even barely miss out on myself being killed as Charmander survives with 1 HP. That was close. 
Naturally for Vaporeon, I send out Pikachu, who takes him out with a couple of Thunderbolts. I take a break from Silthco to defeat the punchy and kicky Pokemon, but Primeape is 7 levels lower than them, so I'm not actually hopeful. The Hitmonlee does a ton of damage with a single double kick before Primeape can take him out with a few cross chops and some furious swiping. The Hitmonchan can obviously take out my monkey at this HP. Instead, he decides to use agility, thrice, before hitting a pathetic two-hit Comet Punch, allowing Primeape to win this fighting Pokemon tournament. Well, I didn't expect to win that the first try. I just wanted to see how it would go, and I am pleasantly surprised. He then offers me one of the inferior Pokemon I just defeated. No thanks. Back in the company of Sylph, Team Rocket blasts off again, and I, again, defeat Giovanni. But this fight isn't even in the anime, so who cares? I do notice a glitch though, saying that Double Kick is not very effective against my Pidgeotto. The same thing actually happened when Bulbasaur got hit by poison moves in the Erika fight. I just didn't want to talk about that battle anymore because it was traumatizing. So that was interesting. And now it's the showdown you've all been waiting for. Haunter vs. Kadabra. In the anime, Haunter doesn't actually fight so much as distract Sabrina with his not funniness, but I wanted to use him here nonetheless. Haunter immediately uses Substitute to avoid getting flashed by this trench coat wielding Abra and proceeds to double team six times in a row before confusing the Abra and taking him out with Thunderbolts. This brings out Kadabra, who hits through my sub somehow and then keeps himself healthy for a good long while. Haunter does manage to set up another sub and eventually takes the Kadabra to an early grave. Last is the Alakazam, who for whatever reason doesn't heal himself and just falls in a few hits. I'm not gonna lie, I was not looking forward to that fight at all since I could only use Pikachu and Haunter, but it turned out all right. First try. Haunter decides to stay in Saffron with Sabrina, so it's time to say goodbye to him next. But this is not nearly as sad as Butterfree. And then it's immediately time for the Ninja Poka Showdown, where I will battle Koga with a level 50 Pidgeotto and Charmander. Yeah, you heard that right, a level 50 Charmander. Have you ever heard of something so ridiculous? But I digress. Ash obviously just prefers cute Pokemon to powerful ones. Doesn't explain the Squirtle, but whatever. Pidgeotto misses a fly and gets psychicked by this Venonat but then takes it out with a couple of wing attacks. The next two Pokemon are also Venonets, got a great team there Koga, and they each fall to a fly apiece. Last is the Venomoth, who immediately toxics my bird, so I use wing attacks and finish him off with one last quick attack. With that, I head to the Safari Zone in episode 035, great name, and search for Tauros. This takes an awfully long time, however, because the Safari Zone is notorious for sucking. Now, in this episode, Ash actually catches 30 Tauros. But since this was never aired in America, I decide to stop at one. Even this one takes a good long while, though. Ash doesn't realize how lucky he is, apparently. I also get the ability to surf. So sparks fly for Magnemite, and I can catch a muck. And that's it. Ash doesn't catch any more Pokemon in Kanto. How can you be the very best with basically no Pokemon? It's around this time that Pikachu's tragic ketchup addiction finally comes to light. If you've been wondering how Pikachu lost so much weight, it's ketchup. Not even once, kids. It's not worth it. And in Dark City, we also meet Ash's twin brother. My name is really Tom Ado. <laughs> I wonder what he's up to now. It's been a long time. In preparation for Volcanic Panic, Charmander finally evolves at level 51, only 35 levels too late. No biggie. After one more evolution, Charizard is ready to face Blaine, all on his own. But first, I need to break the immersion of being Ash by answering these riddles correctly. I hate to break it to you, but again, Ash is kind of an idiot. Are they Pokemon? Don't be dumb! Much like Bind and Rap, in Gen 1, Fire Spin is basically free damage because it prevents enemies from attacking at all. So, a combination of this inarguably cheap move, coupled with Earthquake, and Blaine never stood a chance. 
Maybe if he had a Magmar, like he's supposed to, things would have been different. But for this fight at least, Charizard listens to Ash and wins the seventh badge. Which doesn't mean all that much, because at the Battle of the Badge, Gary shows off the 10 badges that he's collected so far. That's not fair. There's not even 10 badges in this game. Even though I've already faced him twice, Ash doesn't actually face Giovanni here either. Even at the Viridian City Gym, he just has to battle Team Rocket. In that fight, Ash uses Pidgeotto, Squirtle, and Bulbasaur, so let's do this. The Doug Trio can't really do that much to me, and even ends up missing Sand Attack before falling to a couple of Wing Attacks and a Fly. Well, that was easy. The Leggy Persian tries to survive with a double team, but my bird gets two critical Wing Attacks in a row and finishes it off with a Quick Attack. Now, the Nidoqueen has Thunder, but Giovanni, I mean, Jesse and James, haven't made the best move so far, so I decide to take a risk. The Queen does eventually use Thunder, but it's too late to save her life. For the King, I pivot to Bulbasaur to put him to sleep, then bring out Squirtle, who almost takes him out in a single surf. That did a surprising amount of damage from a tiny little turtle. Last is Rhydon, who is quadruple weak to water, so he does fall in one surf. I'm honestly surprised I won on my first try, but it can mostly be chalked up to Giovanni not making the best decisions in life. Specifically, the continued employment of Jesse James and Meowth. Oh yeah, and then Pidgeotto tries to evolve. I've been dealing with this nonsense after almost every battle for some 40 plus levels with multiple Pokemon, and I cannot describe to you how tired I've gotten. I hate it. After the fight, I take my Primeape and leave him with some random fighting trainer who I just barely met. This was supposed to happen forever ago, back in the punchy and kicky Pokemon fight, but I honestly forgot about it until now, so I messed up the timeline. Sorry about that, guys. It's at this point I decide to head home to relax a bit and find out it's Mr. Mime time. I don't even want to know what's going on there. Still, I'm all fired up for Indigo Plateau. Gary is too, and challenges me to another fight. But I've gotten tired of this guy, so I must skip this crap. We'll see him again soon enough. In Victory Road, Ash sees a Moltres that proceeds to be really cheap and just spams Fire Spin. Still, my little turtle manages to take him out with two surfs proving that he's better than a legendary. You know what, maybe I've been too harsh on him. And then he ruins the moment by trying to evolve. What a jerk. This is why no one likes Squirtles. And now it's time to talk about the Elite Four. There are six episodes that span the Indigo Plateau Conference where Ash faces off against random dudes that nobody cares about. In those episodes, Ash conveniently only uses six Pokemon in the tournament battles, and so, those are the ones that I will use in the Elite Four. They include Muck and Kingler for some weird reason that I never understood. Why would you bring out untested Pokemon in the most important battles of your life? They also include Charizard, who hates me, meaning I will only allow him to defeat a single Pokemon throughout the entire Elite Four. This really sucks because he's my strongest team member, but I need to be true to the fact that Charizard just doesn't like me. Let's begin the Lorelei fight using my newly evolved Kingler. He sets up a tiny looking swords dance, but the Dugong still survives the strength next turn and then heals with a rest. No matter, that lets him set up another dance and take out the seal. The Cloister does survive a hit because he has really strong defense and immediately uses a super potion. Gen 1 is pretty weird, but then falls next turn. The exact same thing happens with the Slowbro. Jinx does what she's supposed to and just dies in one hit, as does the Lapras. You know what? That was a pretty good start. Maybe Ash was onto something using Kingler in these battles. Now Kingler, who is my new best friend by the way, could easily take out Bruno, but I wanted to give Little Squirt a try. He obviously defeats the Onix, and the punchy Pokemon isn't that much harder. The kicky Pokemon gets a stupid crit that almost kills him, but not quite. The second Onix falls, bringing out Machamp. At this HP, I decide to pivot to Muck, who screeches, eventually, and then sludges the forearms to death. My Kingler, once again, leads against Agatha. A Surf is almost strong enough to take out the Gengar, but after getting confused, I need to swap. You can't hold berries in Gen 1. I bring out Squirtle, whose Surf is a heck of a lot weaker. He does manage to break a sub and forces Gengar to heal, 
before Agatha swaps to Golbat. He also barely survives a critical surf, confuses Squirt, but then falls to an ice beam. The weakened Gengar tries to double confuse Squirt as the first one wears off and the Gengar gets drowned. After taking a few hits, the Haunter confuses Squirt yet again, so I bring out the King on a Super Potion and another Super Potion as King gets put to sleep. Pikachu makes his Elite Four debut to Thunderbolt the cool looking ghost. Arbok stalls a bit with Rap, but his death is unavoidable. Pikachu is too strong. Last is Agatha's stronger Gengar, but Pika paralyzes that guy and slowly whittles away at his health as Gengar tries to eat some daydreams for some reason, but it doesn't work. I am honestly surprised that all of these matches have been on the first attempt. I've got to admit, little Squirtle is certainly pulling his weight. Maybe I've been a little bit too rough on him this entire time. But Lance is going to be hard. Not the Gyarados though, he is super easy even without a crit. Pikachu paralyzes the Dragonair and tries to set up some double teams but is immediately sniped by a Hyper Beam, even though it didn't do all that much. Pikachu then proceeds to punch this dragon in the face several times until it stops getting up. That took quite a while. The identical Dragonair is also paralyzed as Squirtle comes out to tank a Hyper Beam and kill with two Ice Beams. I pivot to Kingler for Aerodactyl and after failing to kill with a Surf, use a Swords Dance and get crit. Fun. The Crab does take out the extinct Rockbird though. Even with those Swords, the Dragonite survives Strength and then kills with a Thunder. Dang it. It was too much to hope I would defeat all these guys first try. The second attempt starts in the same way with a dead Gyarados and a paralyzed Dragonair. This time though, I decide to swap to Muck on a Hyper Beam recharge turn and then minimize three times. Muck is paralyzed, but a single sludge takes out the Dragonair. The second one hits a wrap that takes an awful long time, but misses a Hyper Beam and also falls to some sludge. Aerodactyl takes a bit longer because Sludge is not very effective. Muck does manage to poison him, and even with some healing, the Aerodactyl soon falls. Last is Dragonite, who misses Fire Blast, Blizzard, and Fire Blast again before succumbing to the almighty Muck. That worked out pretty well. Before Ash can officially become the champion in Kanto, he has one last fight. And it's obviously against Gary. He starts with Sand Slash, but my underappreciated Squirtle shows his true power by one-shotting the Slash with a Surf. That was pretty impressive. The Turtle then manages to bite the Alakazam twice before taking a really rough Psychic to the face. Here I'm hoping that my Kingler will be able to outspeed and finish off the Alakazam, which is exactly what happens. I go for a Risky Blizzard against some Coconuts that barely does more than half. The Executor falls after two Strengths, even after leeching some of Kingler's Seed. Ew, that sounds gross. What's wrong with you, Executor? Said Leeching continues against the Ninetales, but Kingler takes a few quick attacks and defeats the Fox with two Surfs. The Steelless Magnemite does basically nothing against my Bulbasaur, and now it's his turn to get seated. A few sharp leaves, and he goes down. Last is Gary's Vaporeon, who avoids says leaves and almost kills Bulba with an Aurora Beam. So, let's end this fight the way it began with Pikachu shocking the Vaporeon. Or not, because Hydro Pump almost killed him. Instead, Muck hogs all the glory by surviving a Hydro Pump, it's just some water Pikachu, get over it, and killing with one last sludge. And yet again, that fight only took me one try. That was surprising. And I didn't even use the Disobedient Charizard throughout the entire Elite Four. So in the end, we see that Ash, even with his weird habit of not evolving his Pokemon, could have become champion way back in Season 1 if he knew what he was doing. But before we wrap this up, there's one last story point to hit, and that is Pallet Party Panic. Now technically, this happens in the Orange Island arc, but I wanted to do it here just because. So I finally decided to let my darn bird evolve. After having a Pidgeotto since level 9, Ash finally gets a Pidgeot and then immediately gets rid of it. Because once a Pokemon gets too strong, Ash apparently can't use them anymore. Okay, and now that's the game. I hope you enjoyed this Pokemon challenge, and it was the best way I could think of to send off our good friend Ash in style. 
After wandering across several regions for 25 years, this kid deserves a rest. Thank you so much for watching, and next time, I hope to see you back in Paldea.